So my name's Tom, and I'm here for super hot and a couple of uh, sort of side ventures and weird pet projects that we're doing within the confines of super hot as a company. Uh, so the the thing that will be Potentially uh, interesting for some of you is Super Hot Presents, and then there's another thing that I will be talking about that will be interesting for some of the of the remaining people in the room. So chances are half of the talk will be irrelevant for you, but we'll see what happens. Can I get a show of hands, a little bit of stretching first, of uh, uh, who here in the audience is currently uh, working on an indie game or working at a publisher that publishes independent games? That's really good. I really enjoy this. This will be mostly for you guys. Some of this will be about what we can do to help you to, uh, uh, to, to finish your games currently in production, but most of it will be meaty and about what I think is very important and a missing link for business developers in, uh, in uh, indie game development as a whole industry. Uh, so. The title of the talk is Superhot Presents and the other big Superhot project to make self-publishing fun for indies. Uh, it's actually two separate things, so that's going to be really exciting to talk about. Uh, first, very, very quickly, just in case you haven't, uh, you haven't heard about Superhot before, to give you a little bit of context of what it is that we're doing and why we're doing those things. Uh, Superhot is a game that we built for a game gym in 2013. It was a browser playable prototype. It very, very quickly, even though it looked like this, uh, managed to get uh, uh, millions of people playing the, the game. Uh, so we had something like two, three million people playing this prototype in the browser during the first month. Uh, so we took it to Kickstarter, uh, kind of similar to, 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 to Martin, but a lot smaller, and we managed to get enough funds to get us uh, started. It was not enough to finish the game, we still had to figure out some additional deals and figure out how to get more budget to, uh, to complete the entire game, but it was a big start and it gave us a big community to play around with and uh, a lot of credibility that uh, we could use to leverage uh, our negotiating position getting deals later. Uh, when we actually shipped the game, people really liked it. Uh, a lot of people played it, bought it. There was a lot of awards that we got. Then we spent some time and we made a VR redesign, kind of a game from scratch basically, but we reused all of the assets in the core mechanic of the game called Super Hot VR. Uh, and this is even more fun than the original game, which is amazing. Uh, people loved it again, uh, and we got a lot of awards. So now we're here a few years later as a studio that is uh, uh, still an indie in the definition that we are 100% independent. None of the deals that we took were equity-based or revenue share-based, it was just grant money or a little bit of recoup, which is brilliant. It gives us so much freedom to work on the things that we feel are exciting and just YOLO projects uh, that make no financial sense whatsoever or, not, or are not actually aligned with, uh, with game making. Now, one of those projects that we started working on recently and announced uh, uh, this August is uh, Superhot Presents, uh, which is not a publishing label, it's an anti-publishing label. So the, the, the premise is that we, as a studio, don't have enough capacity and we don't have enough um, people to build out structures to have an entire publisher, but knowing from our own experience, sometimes you don't need a publisher. Sometimes you just need a little bit of money and some friendly advice and connections in the industry. Uh, so this year we managed to find a few games that kind of fit what we are looking for and uh, uh, that uh, are uh, ready to take advantage of our, of our, of our terms. Uh, Frog Detective is a fantastic, wholesome game. Knuckle Sandwich, very not wholesome, but also amazing. We signed another game that is still unannounced, and uh, we're probably going to sign one or two more in the, uh, in the nearest future. The terms that we've got for our weird uh, indie non-publishing fund uh, is that we are not giving publishing support. We're not porting your games, we're not localizing them, we're not going to be running your PR and marketing campaigns. We only give you unsolicited advice every now and then. We're basically uh, uh, being a little bit of a smart, smart ass about different things uh, in, your, in your kind of publishing pipeline. Uh, we only give tiny grants, so it's either finishing, uh, finishing funds or really, really tiny, wonderful games. Ideally, the latter. But on the flip side, we, uh, may, we do it so that those games don't need to be beholden to publishers if they don't need to. So we only have 
very, very time-limited revenue share deals. So after a few years, all of the rights, all of the revenue share rights uh, revert back to the developer. It's very friendly. There is no recoup. You make money from from day one. There's no strings attached. And our hope is that at the end of this process, some of those studios will become properly independent like ourselves. So they will be able to sustain themselves, make money, and will be able to also finance crazy weird ventures like, uh, like what we did here. This is just crazy fun. Uh, now to fit this bill, to actually be able to take advantage of a term like this, it's not obvious and it's not easy and there's not a lot of games and productions that actually actually make it uh, into, uh, into this very limited uh, slice of the industry that we're looking at. Uh, because we are not providing publishing, we're not going to build your audience, we're not going to give you marketing, so ideally you have audience already built in into your game. So you have a successful Kickstarter or you've already released a game and you've got a big uh, respectable amount of players that are uh, actively excited about your upcoming title. So a big social media following or just thousands of people on your Steam wish list or uh, one of those Kickstarter campaigns with also thousands of people that have already played uh, your prototypes. Uh, we want the games to be unique and amazing so we're not uh, we're not looking to fund things that are very uh, commercially viable, but kind of boring. We are looking for things that are weird and that are somewhat strange and that we just want to see made in the world ourselves. And most importantly, we are looking for those studios that are uh, committed to becoming independent. There are, there are uh, actively disinterested in working with larger publishers that don't want anybody's help, they want to do it themselves. Uh, and that is something that is uh, not easily achieved, at least not easily achieved uh, when you know what you're signing up for because it takes a lot of work and effort to get your games uh, in a... Uh, to get your games to be commercially successful if you don't have anybody helping you. Now, why are we actually doing all of this? Because looking at the terms and uh, kind of at the fact that nobody else is doing anything exactly as friendly, uh, you could probably guess that this is not a money-making venture. We actually hope that it's just not going to lose money too fast. It's making uh, um, a little bit of money back and that's it. Uh, the reason why we're doing this uh, is because we ourselves have started out similarly. We were independent, we were lucky enough to have this built-in audience that we um, kind of came up with, with the 7-day FPS game gym game, uh, and we figured out how to, how to pull this audience with us through years of development until we actually released uh, the first game and then the second game and then uh, became a proper uh, functioning studio. A little bit dysfunctional, but still functioning. Um, and uh, that was possible for us in part because we were also able to get uh, friendly deals from other places. We were able to get a little bit of money from Oculus, a little bit of money from Xbox, some pre-orders from committed players, and then this Kickstarter, and we had enough funds in the bank to make a, uh, to make a good game, to have some money left in the, in the bank account at the end of the production for marketing and PR, and to have enough people at the studio already to service all of those different roles that you, need to, uh, that you need to have sorted out by the time you ship a game. Uh, but now being 100% independently owned and, and run is also a little bit terrifying because there's nobody, there's no grown-ups in the room, there's nobody telling you how to do things, there's nobody telling you if you're doing the correct thing or not, so you are your own, your own boss which is a dreadful experience um, and uh, one that uh, particularly in well, business development for indie games, from my perspective, because I'm the, the business guy at the studio, uh, is uh, uh, very easy to, very, very likely to drive you insane. So we've got the second thing that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, which is our second, uh, second interesting venture, and this will be a much more meaty and data-heavy and chart-heavy part of my talk. Uh, so the thing that I would like to share with you is some experience from what we are doing as a, as a studio in terms of business development and maintaining our, our products uh, uh, and how we are avoiding this feeling of insanity and just flailing around blindly with nothing to guide us and also how hopefully you can start doing the same thing in the near future. 
So if you look at our, all of our sales across all of our time, we are not going to be talking about this first part of how do you release a game successfully or how you raise funds. That's, you've already heard about that from many different talks. We're going to be talking about how you maintain this long, long uh, process of making the most that you can out of your already released games. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason why we're not going to be talking about that first part is also because when you look at how we started, how we got this initial traction, I don't really know what's the secret sauce for uh, getting millions of people suddenly interested in your game. That's what everybody will tell you, have a great game in the first place and then everything will be fine. But how do you get a great game? Well, that's, that's not my job. That's, uh, that's your job in this particular respect and the job of my uh, fantastic colleagues at the studio who are actually creating those, uh, those, uh, those experiences. So we will not be talking about how you make games, about how you raise funds, about how you launch those games to be successful. We will just be talking about what do you do when you've actually shipped a game, when you've got a game out there in the market, what's your job like then? So. What do you do? What do you actually do if you're a biz dev? And the state of the art in the um, philosophy of business development uh, in, in the games industry for like premium games and indie games like ourselves is you do things. You just kind of hustle around. Uh, you run marketing campaigns every now and then, make sure you've got sales set up. You do a localization every now and then, uh, and you hope for the best. And then at the end of the month, you've got some money in the bank. And for as long as the money in the bank is more than you need to uh, pay your payroll and taxes, you're fine and you feel happy. Uh, this is insane. Uh, and at most, what you hope to achieve is that you're in the industry long enough to get some more experience and intuition that will guide your hustling, that will point you towards the better um, things to be doing with your time and more successful, uh, um, more successful uh, deals um, that you need to focus on. Uh, that is still pretty insane. This is a very, very slow model. It doesn't make it so that you can learn easily. Even if you do things, it's difficult for you to figure out uh, what it is that you've actually achieved. It's, you just feel this rush of dopamine because you've signed the deal. But if, was it uh, the best deal you could have signed or not? It's kind of difficult to, to say. Uh, so what, uh, what we started working on, um, and uh, the, the way that I was trying to stave off this, um, this uh, madness, uh, is to actually start collecting information about what the results of your different ventures are. Uh, and this is, if you're doing this, you're already world class in business development. If you're collecting all of your sales reports and actually actively looking at uh, the marketing and visibility data about your game, you're fantastic. You are, you are way ahead of most everybody else. If you're, do, if you're using this data in a systematic form to guide your decisions, this, I, I think this doesn't really happen in the industry at all. But if, if you do, you are one of, the, one of the select few of the absolute fantastic people that have um, figured out uh, a way to actively learn quickly from your own decisions. Um, and what, what you can do when you're actually collecting all of your information, all of your sales data, which is very, very difficult when you think about it. If you've got two games, super hot as two games, shipped across pretty much every single platform we could find, uh, that amounts to something like 24 different spreadsheets that come through different formats and different, uh, uh, different uh, developer dashboards every month. Uh, to collect them all together, it's just so much work. But uh, if you do manage to, to figure it out, if you do manage to get yourself uh, in a position where you have access to that information, you can start um, kind of feeling better about yourself because when you do things, you see the results. Examples, uh, galore, there's a thing where we did a Chinese localization at one point. And if you have your data uh, for all of your platforms that you ship the Chinese localization on in one single chart, um, uh, you can't see anything. But then when you have an option to filter it down to China, you suddenly realize that, wow, so we've actually, seems like we, we tripled or quadrupled our sales uh, just, after, just after launching. And when you look at the actual numbers, yep, seems like we've made another $100,000 in, uh, in China over just a few, just a few quarters. Uh, if you do things, crazy things like uh, adjust your prices permanently, we, because we're a Polish company and 
Steam introduced Polish uh, Zloty as a currency that you could set up separately at one point. So we uh, dropped the price of Superhot by 66%, somewhere around here. Uh, and uh, this is crazy, but if you've got the data to back it up, you can very quickly validate that this has actually made you $60,000 more in revenue, which is pretty, a pretty decent payday for what is effectively 10 minutes of work to change the price and maybe a couple of hours to uh, schedule a PR and marketing push. Uh, now, when you've got those tools and you've got access to information like this, you can also start uh, figuring out useful models and shortcuts for how you can how you can treat your video game, and ideally you can then try to verify those models when you're actually acting on those uh, on those assumptions. So one assumption that's pretty obvious is kind of like Martin said, um, uh, finding your niche. No, not Martin. It was Pav uh, Pavel uh, said about finding your niche and figuring out what your niche is. Uh, so you have when you've got a game already launched this transforms itself, itself to you have a player base that's already engaged, that has already played your game, bought it, uh, and then you've got this entire niche, the, the maximum that you can hope to achieve. Uh, and this is different based on the game that you've shipped, how far along are you in the process of, uh, of, uh, of developing it, and uh, also just on the niche, on the, on the, on the um, uh, market that you're in. Uh, and the, the nice thing about working at Superhot is that we've got two games which are very, very different in terms of, of this distribution. So we can kind of validate this assumption in a, in a very systematic way. Superhot VR, uh, very successful as a VR game, uh, but VR as a whole, fairly small. So if you assume that you can be on maybe half of the, of the active headsets, uh, you, you're looking at maybe 3 million units right now. Uh, so if you've got a very, very successful game in VR, you are very close to saturating your market. You are very close to actually having nobody else to sell the game to. Uh, whereas in the regular Superhot, even though the sales numbers are kind of similar right now, um, the, the, the total player base that could potentially be interested in Superhot probably 30 million, maybe even more. You can kind of guess that, well, people that like puzzle shooters, uh, people that played Portal and enjoyed it would probably also enjoy Superhot if they, if they, if they got to play it. And uh, uh, if you work on this assumption, uh, that means that Superhot has so many more people that, they can, that we can give the game to uh, without saturating our market that we are allowed to experiment with, uh, with weird and risky things. Like, uh, let's say we're doing a bundle, a humble bundle or something. We're giving away 30,000 uh, keys. It was a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, if you do this, uh, if, you're, if your game is large and your niche is large, what is actually the, the result on your sales charts in Steam is no, no effect. Nobody really cares that the bundle exists. Uh, this is during the time of the bundle. Uh, your sales on Steam will be pretty much the same or actually, or actually increase. Uh, that is... Uh, explainable also in a slightly different way, where you think about who your customers actually are and how they look at your game. Uh, people often, developers often look at their games and they feel like if I put my game on sale too steeply, if there's a bundle somewhere or giveaway, or if it's up on G2A for a dollar, nobody's going to buy the game for a full price, because why would they? But it's only because you are the developer, you know everything about your game, you know your discount schedules, you know what was the deepest discount so far and everything that you've done so far. So you know what were the best deals uh, and what are going to be the best deals for your game. But your customers are more like goldfish. They don't have a memory of what your game was like for the most part. Uh, they are fantastic and they buy your game and you should love them, but uh, you can probably quite accurately model them with the assumption that they have very little slash zero memory of what your game is like. Uh, they just look at your page on Steam or other platform and make an instantaneous decision if they're going to buy this game or not without shopping around, without waiting for a better chance. Uh, and the, this also holds up by uh, just having the, the, the same example with bundles but larger. Uh, we're giving away hundreds of thousands of your keys. And you would expect that, wow, but now my game will be on the aftermarket, G2A will be selling it like crazy, um, and nobody will ever buy my game again. Uh, but uh, when you look at the sales for, this is again super hot, uh, 100,000 keys, 200,000 keys, that's not a lot compared to the 30, 40, 50 million 
potential players of Superhot. Uh, so the, the actual impact of that bundle, negligible. It doesn't really matter if you're doing the bundle or not, it's just extra, extra profit for you. Uh, and uh, if you want to bring it even a step further, uh, this is a, a chart from one of the platforms where we, where we did one of uh, big giveaways to a lot of people at once. Um, and uh, the, the blue spike here is the number of free copies activated. Uh, and the, the, the paid copies you can't really see because it's just one pixel on the same level as the red line here. Uh, so we've, all, we've given away orders of magnitude more copies than we've ever sold on this platform. But the revenue uh, actually didn't change much. If you, if you are really, really pessimistic and you're really looking for some impact of this, uh, of this deal, you can attribute maybe somewhere between 5 and 7% of additional like, revenue decay to, uh, to this deal. And exchanging 5% of your revenue for uh, additional millions of people that you can communicate to and talk about your next games and that are, are exposed to your, to your brand, I think that's a pretty good deal. Similarly, uh, if you've got a very, very big game and a very, very big market and you worry about the effect of key resellers, of king wins and G2As, um, one thing that we're doing with Superhot is um, we have this uh, replay hosting system where you finish a section, you can upload the replay from Superhot onto our servers. Uh, and this also means that we have a, a, a number of how many people are starting the game for the first time, because the, the, the game needs to kind of register for an account on the, on the system of ours. Uh, so we know that uh, during the year of 2018, we had about 1.5 million new players of Superhot on uh, PC on the Steam version. At the same time, we actually just sold 200,000 units on Steam. Uh, and the key reseller aftermarket was about 20,000 units. Uh, uh, so if you're looking uh, at key resellers as an uh, important thing for your game, you're probably not looking in the right place. You're probably addressing the 1% of, well, piracy uh, while uh, ignoring the actual piracy that you could be doing something with. Not necessarily um, preventing piracy, but maybe trying to find ways to communicate with those people uh, because they, they, they spend their time, they played your game, they are your community, and you can try to use them. Uh, one other thing that kind of comes out of this assumption that your customers, your potential clients, are uh, not as aware of your game as you are, uh, is that when you look at the conversion rates of your game, so people looking at your page on Steam or any other place, to the number of people that are actually buying your game, they are pretty static. They don't change over the years. It's not like your game becomes less attractive over time. It's just visibility is, uh, is lower. So if you, are, if you have this piece of information, that your conversion rates are kind of the same, no matter what, uh, what, uh, what is the stage of life cycle of your game, um, that means that uh, what you should actively be trying to do is maximize the, the visibility that you can get for your titles. Uh, the way you do it, usually, the best way that i found so far, uh, is by uh, sort of bartering with platforms. You give, a, you give an offer to have a discount on the, on, the, on the platform, Steam, for example, and then return the feature your game because it's a good deal for customers and people will be excited. Uh, so if you have a deep discount and you can get yourself a nice slot on the platform, that might mean that you're getting hundreds of times more visitors than you would on a regular day. And this amounts to hundreds of times of, uh, hundred, hundreds of times more um, uh, units sold. So uh, on average, if you actually look at uh, pretty much any properly managed games, uh, uh, or like properly, uh, I would say traditionally managed games uh, revenue cycle, Factorio is an, uh, is an, is a, is an outlier here. Uh, about 60 to 70% of your revenue will come from uh, sales and discounts, just because of this increase in visibility that you get from platforms. Uh, but again, this doesn't really hold up for all of your games. If you're in a niche, uh, in a small niche, and you're already kind of saturated, 
getting this additional visibility might not be uh, that valuable because the people that should be interested in your game, a lot of them have already seen it. A lot of them have already bought it. The extra visibility uh, doesn't really work because you're already saturated. So in the case of uh, Superhot, a deal like the one that I've, so I've shown you before with uh, like, uh, hundreds of times of extra visibility, uh, the, um, the, the, the impact of those deals where you get more visibility is uh, significant. You get a lot more, sometimes many, many times more, um, uh, revenue from running deeper discounts just because you get more, more visibility. You have an option to, to negotiate for a better slot. Uh, whereas super hot VR, smaller niche, a little bit more saturated. The effect is not as, not as stark. It's not as important. So doing deep discounts in a niche might actually uh, cause you to lose revenue because uh, you will sell a little bit more units, but at a lot lower of a, of a price. Uh, you have to be mindful of that. Helps when you've got data and when you've got information um, uh, to back up your assumptions and to back up your decisions. Uh, and then, how do you sleep at night as a business person in video games? Uh, you have to figure out how do you decide if you're doing a good job or not. Uh, you can sort of look at charts and say, oh, we're growing year over year, and that's amazing because we haven't released any, any new games. Or you can have uh, a look at all of your uh, regions and say, well, those things what, that we did in those weird growing regions, they actually brought us extra hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you feel that it is amazing. But then you look at uh, numbers like this, um, and you ask yourself, is 0.7 good, or can we do better? We don't really know. Or why is Xbox performing 20 times better in the UK than it is in Germany for us? Uh, or why do we have 25% refund rate in Korea? Um, and uh, then you realize you still can't sleep at night because you really don't have anything to compare against and you don't know if you're doing a good job or not and you are very stressed. So how do we fix this? Uh, I say that there's an option for us to fix this and this is the, the thing that we're working on as, uh, as our secondary, as our second uh, pet project. Uh, in this model, what I think we need and we would all benefit from as, a, as an industry is an additional bit, which is uh, an option to just easily talk and exchange information, benchmarks about your metrics and your, the, the way that you're dealing with uh, your games with everybody else that's friendly and open and, uh, and successful in the industry, because that makes it so that everybody's smarter and everybody's making better decisions in the process. Uh, and to achieve this, we've got ourselves a um, business intelligence platform, which is, as far as I know, the first of its kind in business development for premium console and PC games. Uh, so it's called IndieBI. It actually exists, probably going to be out of beta and officially shipping to more partners uh, sometime middle next year. Right now, it's a closed beta that we're refining the actual things that are available and possible within the platform with a bunch of our friends from the industry. Um, and the way it works mechanically is if you've got those 20-something different um, sales channels, uh, what you can do is you can just take all of those spreadsheets and put them in one single place, and then it gets crunched up, and you can see all of your different sales channels in one, single, in one single chart, and you can compare them against each other and can become smarter. You can add visibility and marketing signals. You can add information about the, the, the buzz that you're generating on YouTubes or Twitters, and you can finally start figuring out what is the actual impact of your decisions. If you've done a marketing campaign, how much has it actually done for you? If you've got this influencer deal, has it actually sold any copies on any platform? Uh, and uh, additionally, what is happening here is that you can start talking about those things with other developers. Now, obviously, getting all of those charts is still a pain in the ass. And uh, I, I, I couldn't be bothered to do it myself. So as a part of the platform, you also have tools that automatically uh, scrape all of the different places where you see your sales and your visibility, wish list, impression information. And this is just, just automatically uploads everything to the platform. So, once you have this all set up, your most up-to-date, most relevant information is just always there when you need it. When you come up with a question that you want to answer, it's just, it's just already there. You don't need to spend another four or five hours collating spreadsheets and copy-pasting information. It's just right in front of you. 
Once you have all of this set up, you can have your data scientists, if you have them, connect to a database and do whatever. Or you can just use um, the, the, the set of different charts and dashboards that we're using at Superhot that we're constantly developing to help us make sense of what we are uh, what we are doing as a company, and you can use it yourself to finally be able to see if your Steam summer sale this year was better than last year, or what's your performance in Japan. And then you can start talking to other developers using the same platform and comparing numbers and knowing what is actually a good performance in, uh, in Japan. So you can start answering questions that you've always wanted to answer, like this refund rate in Korea, or conversion rates, or discounts, and then everything else that you always wanted to ask and that just keeps keeping you up at night. Uh, you can finally start answering all of this. Uh, and then, uh, at the end of the day, you can also just have all of your sales on one single chart, and you can just look at it and be satisfied with uh, the numbers constantly going up. So in this model, what kind of I wanted to communicate to you guys today is that uh, this bit where we're talking about friendly, clever people is actually you guys. It's all of you who are working on indie games right now, people that are already published indie games, publishers of games that are looking to empower themselves with more information, with better tools to, uh, to manage the games that they're responsible for. Uh, so you are very welcome, and I would be extremely happy if you guys went to indiebi.com if you are at all interested and left your email address, so that once this thing is out of beta, we can start uh, messaging you and letting you know what to do to get this all set up and signed up for. Uh, this is pretty much the end of my presentation. So two things, two separate uh, side projects that we're working on at Superhot. One is just funding games and trying to help out with some interesting indie projects. And the other thing is weird and crazy and does loads of data crunching and, uh, and charts. I'm excited about both of them, uh, and I would be really interested to hear what questions you have right now. <laughs> Brilliant. No questions. It's fantastic. Okay, then. Uh, so, thank you very much. If you want to ask anything, you can do it now, you can do it after the show, you can catch me uh, when I'm just romping around the, the show floor. Uh, I'm very happy to, to be here with you guys. Uh, be sure to reach out. Thanks.